Welcome back to Mastara, as we are looking at the biggest, most impressive, and just stunning bits of Mastara, the wonders. This includes man-made wonders, magical wonders, and naturally occurring wonders. These are purely subjective on my part, as there's no definitive list of wonders, so if I leave one off, it was never worthy of being on the list in the first place. Some of the wonders have been created to kill continuity errors that people have long pointed out. To qualify, a wonder has to be at least well known in the area. The world elevator is easy to spot because of its massive size, even if it is just a large wooden elevator operated by pulleys and a team of pack mules. The mystic conveyor is a complete mystery even to those who live near it, so despite it being a magical artifact that connects the hollow world and the surface world, it doesn't qualify. But enough with the explanations, let's start exploring. I'm Mr. Welch, and it's time to fill you with a sense of awe. In no particular order, we start with the Arch of Fire in Norwald. These are a pair of volcanoes located not quite 300 miles west of the Hin city of Liha. One volcano is an outgoing portal to the Plane of Fire, and the other one is an incoming portal to the Plane of Fire. That means the first volcano spews out a massive geyser of fire and magma, which jets across the sky before entering the second volcano, completing the journey. The volcanoes are over 100 miles apart. It makes them visible from leagues away. However, the area around the volcano are populated by creatures of fire like Afrit, Salamanders, and other creatures native to that plane. While the view of the Arch of Fire is spectacular from quite a distance, approaching it is very dangerous. The first created wonder on the list is the Great Dams of Lake Stahl. Stahl is unusual as it's a lake fed by a single river, the Sturdal, but it empties into three different rivers, the Stur, the Laradar, and the Evermere rivers. Normally this would be impossible, but the dwarves found a way by creating massive dams that also pump water in equal portions to each river. As the water from all three rivers are needed by various underground dwarven cities, it's important that the lake is divided between them. To this end, the dwarves have built the three massive dams at the mouths of each of the rivers, and used the dams to ensure that the various towns will each receive an equal share of water. The town of Greenston and the city of Evermore are in charge of operating the dams and keeping the supply of water constant. The lakes were such a success that the dwarves have begun duplicating their design on a lesser scale on Lake Clintest. Heading to Alphacia, you will find two great wonders, the first being the Citadel of Betelin. The first thing you will see when you approach the city is it seems to be built on the side of a mountain. When you arrive, you will realize it is the mountain. The Alphacians built Citadel by carving up the mountain of the same name and creating the largest fortress in the world. Citadel contains thousands of troops with airships able to dock at the top of the fortress easily. The people of Betelin are a highly religious people who do not trust their neighbors, even though they are all part of the same empire now. The Citadel reflects a time when Alphacia was not quite as unified. The wizards are still fragmented in their interest, but the Citadel has never been used in a time of war. The other Alphacian wonder is an entire kingdom, that of Floating R. The wizard R used his common levitating magics to lift the kingdom up into the air. Alphacians don't consider the spells used impressive. These are the same spells wizards use to create skyships. But what was impressive was the time required to levitate the entire nation. The nation is a tourist attraction for rich Alphacians, especially the magic-using nobility, not only because of its novelty, but because the nation is beautiful and well-maintained. The floating nation is largely populated by nobility. Because of the difficulty growing enough food to feed everyone, most of the slaves and servants were relocated to the surface to work the farms and plantations. Floating R has intelligent flying creatures of all sorts living in its borders, though hostile, evil, or even worse, non-magic-using creatures are usually asked to leave. Another flying wonder is the gnomish city of Serene. Where R is set up as a luxury retreat for wizards and nobles, Serene is open to anyone who can afford it. It's also one of the few examples of surviving Blackmoor technology, and even more impressively, it's a stable Blackmoor device. The city is set up almost entirely as a tourist resort. They fly around to various friendly nations and bring visitors to Serene to enjoy themselves, and more importantly, spend vast sums of money. The city alone is impressive, but then the gnomes use the same principles that they use to create Serene to construct smaller flying craft they use for defense and transportation. The World Elevator is a mundane creation created by Derek and engineers to gain access to the goods of the Etrugan people. It was no small feat creating it, as they used no magic and painstakingly built the elevator up the cliffside one piece at a time. The finished creation was a marvel of design, capable of lifting caravans up the half-mile cliff face with the help of entire teams of oxen, mules, or horses pulling the chains. The elevator has created a bit of a tourist trade for the Bear Clan, something the clan is still uncomfortable with as they have large numbers of isolationists among their numbers. The elevator has also brought unprecedented wealth to the Bear Clan, and the influx of trade goods has created all sorts of new problems for them. On the edge of the Savage Coast, you will find the crossroads city of Slagovich, and there lies the next wonder with their ingenious lock system that allows the city to bring ships from the ocean far below directly to the city itself. 
The city has sealed off a natural cavern with large doors. Then when the ships enter the cavern, the city uses pumps to flood the cavern and raise the ships to the docks, waiting for the new cargoes. The locks have turned Slagovich from a minor trading post to one of the more powerful mercantile city-states in the region. Heading back to Norwald, off the coast of the Frostfist Peninsula to the far north lies the Angry Waters, a massive whirlpool dozens of miles across. The whirlpool is far away from civilized lands, but it was discovered and made famous by explorers from Alphacia while settling Norworld. The whirlpool is a gate to the plane of water, and creatures from the plane are common to the region. The wonder would be a serious hazard to shipping if it was close to civilized lands, but on the far northern border of Norworld, it is easily avoided. Alphacians are known to visit the whirlpool and their skyships out of curiosity, as well as hunt some of the elemental creatures common to the region, but no one dares approach it on the ocean. For sheer beauty, the Coral Palace of Irindi has few equals. The entire structure was carved from a single gigantic piece of blue coral, and has been used as the official state house since its creation. Everyone who has ruled over Irindi, from Makai chiefs to the Thaitian provincial governors to the kings and queens of Irindi, held court in the palace. The purpose of the building has changed in recent years, with the power of the government shifting to an administration-style government, while the royalty has become purely ceremonial. Now tours are held through the building on a daily basis, and the palace is used to entertain tourists more than make political decisions. The Valley of Dawn in Thothia, on the Isle of Dawn, contains long-fabled structures that are equal parts national treasures and complete mysteries. Many of the buildings resemble the pyramids found in the remote region of Nithia in Yalarum, though most Thothians refuse to believe that the scattered and remote Nithians would be capable of building such magnificent structures. The Thothians treat the pyramids and temples as monuments to the immortals, regarding them as national treasures. Few people are allowed inside, and only with permission from the pharaoh himself. Forays into the buildings are equal part searching for fabled treasures believed to be inside, and also to hunt down the terrible monsters also known to be inside. Of course, the buildings were created by the Nithian Empire during their heyday, but due to the curse of the immortals, everyone has lost all knowledge of the building's origins. In the sprawling city of Thyatis, visitors will be drawn to the site of the Great Colosseum, the largest structure in the city. The Colosseum dwarfs even the Imperial Palace, and for Thaisians, it's much more important. It's built to hold tens of thousands of visitors. The Colosseum famously holds the gladiatorial games, but holds all sorts of entertainments like chariot races or distractions like carnivals. The floor of the Colosseum is modular that allows quick changes to be made through an impressive elevator system that can insert monsters, hazards, or new gladiators to the arena as needed. The bottom of the Colosseum can be sealed and flooded, allowing actual naval battles to be recreated. For the largest events, the Emperor and his family will attend, and those draw in the largest crowds. The Colosseum is one of the few places where you will find commoners and nobility enjoying the same event with equal fervor, something that holds Thaitian culture together. On the steps of Ethengar lies two great wonders, one inside the other. First you find the land of black sand, an expansive desert comprised of a fine black sand. The region feels almost alien, with almost no animal life present at all in the desert. It is filled with numerous animal spirits, and the further in you travel through the land of black sand, the more spirits you encounter, and the more likely they won't be friendly. At the center of the land of the black sand you will find the World Mountain, an enormous mountain of unknown height. It is the only mountain in all of Ethengar, and it reaches high into the ever-present clouds, preventing explorers knowing its true height. What is known is that the mountain pierces the spirit plane. Explorers who attempt to scale the mountains will instead find themselves inside the spirit plane. Both regions are considered cursed by normal people, but the Spirit Mountain is the holiest spot in the world for Ethengar spirit shaman. The largest forest in Mistara, without question, is the Candlebarth Forest, created by the Sylvan Elves as their homeland. Here the trees grow to impossible heights as well as thickness. All the clans of the Alfheim Elves have made their houses high in the trees, leaving the ground for various Sylvan and Fey creatures. Gates to other lands are common with the good and the bad magic spots, and portals to the land of the Fey, known as the Good Kingdom, are numerous. Most visitors have to admire the Candlebarth Forest from a distance, as the elves do not appreciate visitors, except for the few they allow to Alfheim Town, their airset's capital. Going back to the gnomes, this wonder had an entire module devoted to it with the Earthshaker. This is a gargantuan mechanical invention created by a group of gnomes located in Devania. It towers over just about everything else in Mistara at a staggering 120 stories, or just under 1300 feet and requiring voluminous amounts of coal to operate. The construct is partially magical, but it is largely mechanical. It can't move under its own power, and the gnomes have to maintain it to keep it functioning correctly. Earthshaker is part of a traveling carnival, so it is used primarily as a sideshow act. Though as part of that act, it will perform feats of engineering at an impossible rate, 
like digging a canal inside of a single day. That is 13 of the Greatest Wonders of Mastara. This was simultaneously one of the hardest and easiest videos to research. It was easy because there were so many different wonders to choose from, with lots of information on the location, history, and dimensions of these wonders. And it was difficult because other wonders that you would easily look for, like the tallest mountain, are in dispute depending on which book you look in. There are five different mountains that qualify as the tallest, depending on various sources, all of which change the information on the other various candidates. The ones that were in contention, I left off in lieu of the ones that were more easily verified. Next up on the list is the interplanar influences on Mastara. As always, you can vote on the other options that are still up there. If you don't like the voting process and you would prefer me to just go in order of what I've got written down, let me know. But until next week, remember, it's awe. A-W-E.